You know, preachers, we love numbers. You know, we love numbers and big numbers and big buildings and big, big full buildings. That just makes a preacher smile, you know? But I tell you what makes heaven smile, what makes heaven rejoice, is when one person comes to know Jesus as Savior. Amen? One person. One person. I want to ask you a question this morning, a couple questions, to start off our new series. First of all, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? Think about that a little bit. What do you think of when you hear the word Christian? Second one is, is what is at the core? When you strip everything away from our church, all the programs, all the Sunday school, and all the preaching and all that stuff, what is at the core of First Baptist Kaiser? What, what are we here for? What are we here for? And we're going to talk about both those questions as we progress and proceed this morning. There is 7.6 billion people in the world. Take that in just a minute. 7.6 billion people in the world, plus a little. And most, most uh, people that do these kind of surveys and things said there could be as many as uh, 248 million people that don't know Christ or more. It's a staggering number, and so many times, I think, as our walk, walk as a Christian, and we, we hear it all the time. You hear me preach it. You hear it when you read your Bible. I'm supposed to go and, and tell people about Christ, and I'm supposed to bear good fruit, and I'm supposed to help win people to Christ. But where in the world do I start? And what I love about this new series, this new a theme that is ringing throughout the Southern Baptist Convention this spring is you can just start with one. Just one. And it makes it so much easier. Throughout the Southern Baptist Convention, these, this sign and these numbers, this, this theme is going to be going on in many, many churches. Who's your one? Who's your one? I want you to be able to ask, how's your one? How are you doing with your one? Well, how is your one doing? And I want us to encourage each other as we take off on this great adventure. And this is not something just for a few months. I pray this will all be, always be at the forefront of our mind over the next however many years we're all here together. Because it just makes it real simple. Way back in the 70s, they used the same kind of theme, each one, reach one. And it's just, it simplifies it. It simplifies it so much. The first followers of Jesus didn't call themselves Christian. A while ago, I asked you, what do you think about when you hear the word Christian? As a matter of fact, the word Christian is only in the Bible three times. Did you know that? Three times. How many times do you think the word disciple is in the Bible? 281. So see, it's a little bit more. And, and what's happened, guys, and, and I'm not here to say we're going to quit calling ourselves Christians, uh, as I was looking at uh, at the... Uh, Brother Greer preached this, and, and the, the notes come from him. This is being handed down from some of the greatest preachers in our country. But he said, I'm not here to change your name from Christian to disciple, but he said, I want you to understand that a lot of people now think they're a Christian because they were born a Christian. What does that mean? They were born into a Christian family. That mom and dad went to church, and they took me to church, and grandma and grandpa went to church, and they took me to church. And so now, if you ask most of America... Are you a Christian? You still get yes. You'll get about 60 to 70 percent will say, yes, I'm a Christian. But here's the question that bothers me. When you follow that up with, are you born again? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Only 30 percent of that 70 percent say that yes. Only 30 percent of the 70 percent that said they were Christians say they are born again, that they know Jesus as their personal Savior. There's a disconnect there somewhere. And guys, I think we've got to the point where it's kind of like, you know, when you're filling out some forms and it says, are you uh, Caucasian or Afri African American or, or Latino, whatever, you know, check those boxes. I think it's where we're getting where we just check the box as Christian because that's the way I was brought up as a Christian. But you know, if you look in the, the scripture over in Acts at the first church in Antioch is where they were called Christians, and it was a derogatory term. They were making fun of them. Look at those little Christs running around. They think they're little Jesuses running around. And they were making fun of the people. Disciple changes the whole thing when you look at it. I'm going to be a follower of Christ. 
I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to do what Jesus does. I want to be able to do what Jesus did while he was here on earth. Now, I understand that we are not in the miracle business what he was, but you know what? If Jesus wants to do a miracle today, he can. He can. But he wants us to be like him. Let's look at our scripture this morning. On earth as it is in heaven. And when I say that as a title this morning, Jesus wants us to get ready to, for living in heaven like, like we're there. He don't want us to wait until we die and start enjoying being, a, being in heaven and being a disciple and, and rejoicing in this what we know. We, we sometimes, guys, we, we look around at, at Christians and, and disciples and we look sad. Everybody don't want to be a Christian because they say, well, all you got to do is, all you guys do is just take away a bunch of stuff you can't do. And that just sounds sad to me. Guys, what, we're not taking away what we can't do. We're gaining something. We're gaining Jesus Christ. We're gaining the man that can speak to the water and to the wind. You know what they do? They obey. We're speaking of the one that can just look at a disease and say, be gone. And guess what? They get healed. We're speaking of the one that stepped up to Lazarus' tomb. And he says, Lazarus, come on out of there. And the dead rise again. That's who we serve. Are you excited about that? Oh boy, I got to go to church again. It's no reason people don't want to talk about Jesus. It's no reason, guys. We got I know some of us, it's not in our DNA to be all excited and cheerleady about it. You know, we're not going to be throwing pom poms around at church, work tomorrow. But, guys, we are to be excited about the master that we serve. This is the real deal. If you don't think he's the real deal, then you might want to go somewhere else. You're kind of wasting your time. And I hate to say that. But, guys, we, we need to get excited about our Lord again. We're excited about everything else but Jesus, me included sometimes. Thursday, you know what Thursday is? I do. It's opening day. It's baseball's opening day. It's the biggest day of the year for me. It's a holiday. And I got to go to the orthodontist of all days. I, I'm, on, I'm about to, I'm going to cancel it, I think, all right? But it, I get excited about that. You know what we ought to be getting excited about is people seeing and coming to know Jesus as Savior. Our young people, they, they, they have college and high school, they have great, great feelings for people that are suffering in the world. And that is wonderful. But you know what the greatest suffering is ever going to be known to man? It's going to be entering into eternity without Jesus Christ. That ought to move us. Yes, it moves me that people are suffering, that they don't have food, that they don't have drinkable water. That moves us. But the greatest suffering above all that is going to be people going out into eternity and they don't know who Jesus Christ is as their Savior. That is the greatest suffering ever. We get all fired up about people that need, you know, helping the needy, and we love doing that. We love helping those that are in need, true need. But you know what the greatest need in this country is today? Is they need to know Jesus as their Savior. That's what they need to know. So guys, as we think about this, on earth as it is in heaven, may we get excited on earth as they do in heaven. May we tell people about Jesus and be excited about and worship the Lamb Worthy is the lamb who was slain. This is amazing grace. All that I do, I sing for him. Do we sing for the Lord because he, he's put joy in our heart? May what on earth, he said, this is a, a preview. I want this to be a preview of what you're going to see in heaven someday. On earth as it is in heaven. We should want things happening here that are happening in heaven. What's happening in heaven? They're rejoicing when one comes to know Christ as Savior. We should rejoice over that. We're baptizing next week. When we baptize, every member of this church are to be here. Every member are to be here because that's what we're here for. You strip everything away. You strip Sunday school away and you strip a children's church away and you strip the tree away and, and Bible school and, and Bible studies and all those things we love to do, worshiping. At the core of this is seeing people come to know Jesus. That's what's our core. That should be our core. That should be what we're about on earth as it is in heaven. Let's read Matthew 4, 18 through 22. As Jesus is walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. 
That's kind of a neat term, isn't it? I'll send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Next screen. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, and they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. And they followed him. This is what it's like to follow Jesus. This is what it's like. Our first one this morning, Jesus doesn't choose the best, he chooses the willing. Let me give you a little Hebrew history, which I just loved when I studied it this week. When you were a little Hebrew boy, about five years old, they would send you off to Torah school, T-O-R-A-H. Torah is the first five books of the Bible, what we call the books of law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're also the five books of the Bible that everybody believes that Moses wrote. And these little boys would begin to study the Torah. And they would study and study and study. And about the time they got to be about 10, they'd kind of take the, the top 20% of the class, the ones that were really getting into it, the ones that really were grasping it, and they would leave them in school, and the rest of them would go back home to dad and mom, and they would begin to be apprentices in the family business. For the next seven years, these boys now at 10 would continue studying the Torah along with other books of the Old Testament, and they were getting to know Jesus really well getting to know God really well. At about 17, then they would make a decision. Here's what they'd say. Some of you really want to do this. Some of you really want to proceed, and you want to be a follower. You want to be a disciple. And so they would go out, and they would encourage them to go out and find a rabbi. You've heard that word sometimes in the Bible. Rabbi means teacher. And they'd say, I want you to go find a rabbi that you admire, that you have faith in, that you really enjoy hearing, and you believe they can teach you the word, and I want you to go to them and ask them if you can follow them. And they would follow that rabbi. And I mean, they would, they would learn from the rabbi. They would learn wonderful things from the rabbi. They would just want to know everything about him. They'd want to know how he done things, how he spoke, how he went up against, how he answered questions, how he dealt with life situations. They became just like the rabbi. Now, there were some rabbis that were even above those rabbis. They were very high, and they had authority. And the rabbis would come to those two rabbis. A couple of them are mentioned in the Bible. Ha'il, Ahil was one, H-A-L-I-E-E-L. The other one was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the one that Paul set at his feet, and he learned from him. And so, now, understanding that, and we look at these verses, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting their net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Now, what does that tell you? They were fishermen. They flunked out of Torah school because they had a job. They weren't rabbis now. They weren't teaching the job. So they flunked. What does it tell me? Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. Jesus went with the B team. Jesus went with the B team. We all think, I don't know the Bible enough. When, I, when we ask you to tell someone about Christ, I don't know the Bible enough. I'm not sure I can handle it. I'm not sure I can tell them the right things. I don't know the scriptures well enough. I'll tell you what, I'll go get the preacher. Nowhere in the New Testament will you find that Jesus said, when someone comes to you to know about me, go get the preacher. He said, tell them about me. Tell them about how I've affected your life. Many of us are scared to death to say anything about Jesus because we're, we don't feel like we're able enough. We're looking at ourselves. We're looking at ourselves rather than looking at the one that wants to work through us. I don't think we ever lose confidence in Jesus, but I think we do lose confidence in us that Jesus can work through us. Look at Peter. Remember Peter walking on the water? What did he say? Lord, if that's you, can I come walk on the water too? He said, yeah, come on. Peter stepped out of that boat, Sonny went to walking on the water. What happened to Peter? Peter didn't lose confidence in Jesus. He looked down and lost confidence in himself. He lost confidence that Jesus was able to do what he said he would do. Now, who, who helped Peter take them first few steps on the water? Jesus. Who would have kept Peter walking on across that lake if he wanted to? Jesus. You see where, where Peter failed? He lost confidence in what God could do through him. 
Guys, if we don't lose confidence in Jesus, we should never lose confidence in what Jesus can do through us because guess who's still doing the work? Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus Christ. Now, look forward here. Think about this. Think about this rabbi thing and all that. They didn't have to go and pick Jesus. They didn't have to beg Jesus to be their rabbi. Jesus chose them. How amazing is that? That Jesus has chose them. Guess what? When you said I do to Jesus, he chose you. He chose you. And you know what he said? My Holy Spirit's going to come and live in you. It's going to come and live in you. And I'm going to give you power that you can go represent me. You can go be my ambassador. You can be my representative. And wherever you go, I'll go. And I'll help you lead someone to Christ. So that takes all the hard work out of it. Because Jesus is going to work through us. Here's the question. Do you believe that Jesus can work through you to bring someone to Jesus? Everybody raise your hand. All right? Oh, some of you are scared. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Are you doubting you? Are you doubting what Jesus can do through you? You're doubting you. But who's in you? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the, in the world. That's Jesus. You got Jesus in you, guys. You're winning. But we think if we're not the top of the top, we think if we're not in that top 20% of the Torah class, God can't use us. And all through the Bible, he always used the B team. We don't like to be on the B team. We don't like to be on the JV squad. We only get to play three innings. We only get to bat one time. I got a daughter that's on the JV squad. We like to be on the varsity. We get to bat at least four or five times. We get to go out there every inning and play the outfield or the infield or pitch or catch. We like to be the team that everybody comes to watch. What makes me so sad is when the JV starts, everybody goes home but mom and dads. We didn't come to see the B team. We come to see the A team. You know what Jesus did? He said, I come to see the B team. I can work with them. I can work with them. The A team, they'll never lean on my own power because they think they know it all. All those high up rabbis, a lot of them, if they weren't really sold out to God, they'd get caught up in their self. All these great preachers and all these preachers out there, they're not really careful. They're trying to do it in their own power, and that's why you fall flat on your face. And I've done that a time or two in my life. And it's the worst feeling in the world to get up here without the power of Jesus. It's the worst feeling in the world. Jesus wants you. He wants you to be available. He said, I can use you just like you are. Come on, let me teach you. There was a saying when you, had, when you really got a lot of the rabbi, he says, you're so, you're so much like your rabbi, you got, your dust, you got his dust all over you. That was a saying back in the days. You're so much like your rabbi, his dust is all over you. Guys, I'm telling you, what we should want as a Christian and as a disciple, as a follower, is that Jesus' dust is just all over us. We're so much like Jesus that, we wanna, that people just want to come to us and say, tell me about Jesus, because you act like you know him. That's all it is. It's not knowing a whole bunch of scriptures, and yes, there's great scriptures, and they can help you, but it's just, it's just telling them about the man you know, the man that changed your life, the man that's brought miracles into your home, and that brought children into your home, and, and brought, brought you through tough times, brought you through difficult times, and you got through that other side, and guess what? The great shepherd had led you through, and you're still there, and he's still there, and he's still loving you. That's what you tell people about. That's what they need today. People are lonely. People are struggling. People don't know. And they need someone, and they need somebody, and his name is Jesus. They need somebody, Jesus. Man, what great things to think about. Amen? Let's go on. He chose us, not we him. Matthew 19, eight says, come follow me, Jesus said. Come follow me. Come follow me. It says this, he said, Follow me, and he, told, he said, some of you are struggling now with marriage, career, parenting. Believe this, friend, if you are Jesus' disciple, then he chose you. A lot of us think about this. We're thinking about everything that we struggle with, and man, I, you know, we think about Jesus can do things so much better. Man, if Jesus was, was a husband to Diana, he would do everything perfectly, and I can't do that. If Jesus was the father of my children, and he, he was their daddy, he, he would do everything perfectly. But you know what? Jesus didn't do it that way. He said, Todd Vinson, I picked you to be Dana Walker Vinson's husband. And I'm going to work through you 
and we're going to take care of her. And he said, Todd Benson, I'm giving you Abby, Libby, and Annie. And I'm going to work through you. Now, you think you're not a good daddy. You think you fail a lot, but I'm going to work through you, and you're going to be a good daddy. You may think you're not very good at your job. And somebody can do my job way better. Somebody can tell people about Jesus way better than I can. But what's Jesus say? I'm going to work through you, and we're going to tell somebody about Jesus. Isn't that something? He chose us, not we him. Go back to our Torah school. They're looking for a rabbi. They're, they're having to go out and ask a rabbi. And maybe the first rabbi said, no, I'm full. Maybe the second rabbi said, well, I've seen your grades, and I don't want you in my group. Maybe the third rabbi finally said, yes, I'll take you if nobody else will. That could have been a real difficult thing if you really wanted to be a teacher, if you really wanted to be in the Word. But Jesus come to these guys and shows them, come follow me, Jesus said. Come on. You don't have to look anymore. And I'm telling you this morning, you may think your life is empty. You may think that your life is not what you intended it to be. You may think that your life is a big dud. But I'm telling you, if you believe in Jesus, there's no way it's a dud. Because he has plans for you before the world was even created. We talked about that this morning. He said, I had plans for you before the world was even created. I've got a plan just for you. And I want to use you. Come on, let's go. How many in this room believe that every, everyone in this room has a plan that's made by God for their life? They do. They do. Now, let me tell you this. There's a lot of times Todd took detours because I wanted to get over on the superhighway and God wanted me to drive out here on the gravel for a while. And he'll do that because that's how he teaches us. Right, Jason? That's how he teaches us. He gets over on the gravel road and it's bumpy over there and it, the dust is getting all over your clean car and you're bumping all around and you're going through some tough stuff in life, but guess what? God's still there. But we always want to get back out up there on the four lane. It's greater out there. Jesus said, come on, come on, follow me. Come follow me, I've got a plan for you. You know what's great about Jesus? He'll let you get out there and do a detour, and he'll still just stand there. He's the most patient man. He'll just stand there and wait on you. And he'll pray for you, and he'll wait. And all the time he's going, Todd, Todd, come on. Come on, Todd, I've got, I got a better plan over here. Come on. And you know what? When you go back and you repent, and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. He said, all right, you're forgiven. Let's learn from that, and come on, let's finish the plan I got for your life. Isn't that great? That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. John MacArthur said this, God skipped all the wise of the day. The great scholars were in Egypt. The great library was in Alexandria. The great philosophers were in Athens. The powerful were in Rome. He passed over Herodias, an historian, and Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar. He chose men so ordinary it was common comical no rabbis no teachers no religious experts he just said i want you i want you he didn't go for the best he went for the b team how great that is wow he you did not choose me but i chose you i appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the father in my name he will give you john 15 6 and you notice what he's talking about there i want you to produce fruit I want you to go out there and tell people about me. I want you to make fruit. I want, when you're, a, when you're a, a, an apple tree, you make apples. When you're a banana tree, you make bananas. When you're a Christian, what do you make? You make Christians. You go and help make Christians through Christ, of course. And he said, I'm there for you. And he said, I want you to make good fruit. And he said, in the process of making fruit, anything you ask me in my name, I'll answer it. What's that saying? I want to lead somebody to Christ, Lord. I got one on my mind. I'm already thinking about my one. And I don't really know even where to start, but I've got that one, and I'm going to start by praying. And you know what God said? You ask anything in my name to get that one to come to Christ, I'll answer it. That's power right there. That's power. See, we want to take and turn that verse around. The world turns that verse around. Oh, you just go ask anything. They'll tell you this on TV. You go ask for anything, and, and God will give it to you. Just take that verse right there and pray over that new Cadillac. God will give it to you. He ain't talking about no Cadillac. He's talking about producing fruit. What's producing fruit? That's telling people about Jesus. And he said, you ask in my name. You say, Lord, I don't feel very qualified. Lord, I, I don't feel like I know the scripture. Whatever your excuse, whatever you're worried about, 
And it may be legitimate. You know, I'm just, I don't talk very good. I'm scared to talk in front of people. He said, just ask him my name and I'll help you. And we'll go see and we'll bear fruit together. J.D. Greer, pastor at uh, Summit Church, North Carolina. They went from 300 plateaued church to now they have 10,000. His goal was to plant 150 churches, I think, by 2025. No, it's 1,500 churches by 2025. But here's what he said. He said he was in college. They started a little Bible group just to kind of get people to come and ask questions. And he said we went on for several months, and it wasn't doing great. He said but we had about 12 of us, and we weren't seeing a lot of new people come. We were kind of a little bit discouraged. And so we decided to have this big mixer, you know, a mixer like a, a get-together, you know. And so we made up flyers. Man, we invited people for a month, and, and we were excited, and we was praying God would send us a bunch of people to come and read the Bible with us and, and learn about Jesus. He said, we're getting close to the time. And he said, there was a, there was a girl in our group. And he said, when she would talk, you'd have to lean over. She, she was so timid. She was so scared. He said, you can hardly hear her. She, she just get nervous. You could tell it when she would talk to people in a group. She, she just got nervous. He said, we're sitting there at the table, and, and we're in the lunchroom. We're talking about the big event. It's coming Tuesday night. And here it is like Friday. And they're, they're, just, they're just all praying over it. They're all talking about it. He said, all of a sudden, this girl, I think he said her name was Amy. He said, she crawled, crawled up on the table in the, in the cafeteria. He said, what in the world has got into her? He said, then she stomped her foot. And boy, everybody looked up and he said, my goodness, what is she doing? And he said in that little mousy voice, she said, We're going to have a Bible class this week. And I just would love to tell all of you about the man that changed my life and what he can do for your life. He said, that's about all she said. She said, I am. He said, what are you doing? She said, I just felt like the Holy Spirit told me to do that. He said, now I'm not saying every time the Holy Spirit tells you to do something crazy, you do it. Or maybe you should. But he said, I will tell you this. On Tuesday night, we had 700 people there. The Holy Spirit wants to move in your life. We so talk about being indwelled with the Holy Spirit that when we got saved, the Spirit moved into us and we never use it. If we seriously use the Holy Spirit that is living in us, we would turn this town upside down. And I'm guilty too, guys. We have seen blessings beyond blessings in our church. This is great. But I'm telling you, we're still just scratching the surface. There's bigger things coming. Just hold on to the rope. And let's go with him. Come follow me, Jesus said. And I can hear that as loud today in Kaiser First Baptist Church as him saying, come follow me. And if we will, there's no telling what he's going to do. No telling. Are you scared? Or are you excited? I think I'm a little of both. But there's nothing impossible for our God. Amen? Wow. Wow. Amazing. Next one, we got to hurry. Our primary calling is to be with him. And the same verse again, come follow me to be with him, to be like him, to, to want to know more about him, to want to do those things. Our primary calling, to get to know Jesus. He didn't tell them that they were going, he didn't tell them where they were going or what assignment he had for them. His primary call is not to do something, it is to become like him. Jesus, think about that a minute. Jesus didn't say, here's what I want you to do. Boom, 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 boom. He just said, I want you to come follow me and be like me. Man, just think about how awesome we'd be if we could be like Jesus. Whew. He didn't really give us a long list, of laundry list of what to do to, to be more like, to, to be accepted by him because we already been accepted on the cross. And when we say, please forgive me, and he, he forgave our sins. And now all he asks us, he said, come, come be like me. Going back to our rabbi story. 
The rabbi, you would learn their mannerisms. You might even wave, their, wave your hand like they did. I mean, you're just like a, a picture, photo, photocopy of your rabbi. They, they, how they answered certain questions and how they uh, responded in situations in life. I love this, I love this thing. This thing just made me say hallelujah in my office the other day. He said, listen to me, the world is going to cut you. Everybody agree to that? The world is going to cut you. But when you bleed, bleed Jesus. Woo! Woo! How we respond to situations in our life is how much we know Jesus. If every time something goes wrong in our life and we just throw a big hissy fit and we scream and yell at people and we scream at people that are giving in our food and we scream at people at the Walmart and we scream at people at AT AT&T and they all make you want to scream. We scream at the people at insurance. They sure want to make you scream. But listen, if everything that comes out of our mouth is screaming at somebody, we're not bleeding Jesus. This world is going to cut you. Bible says you will have temptations. You will have trials. But he says when it cuts you, you bleed like Jesus. Man, isn't that a great saying? Isn't that a great thought? Wow. Wow. Guys, we have a lot in this church to let you know Jesus better. I love worship hour. I love being with you guys. But guys, we have Sunday school class. And I'm telling you, the best way to get involved in this church is first of all, get in, get in a small group. Get in one of these small group doors right here. You can have door number one or door number two or door number three. I'm telling you, you see this guy right here? He'll put you in a class right after church. And guys, that's where you get started. And then we've got small groups on Wednesday night. We study God's Word. Sunday night, we study God's Word. We're fixing to start two Bible studies, men and women. There's stuff for the teens. There's there's daily quiet time that you have on your own. It don't all have to happen in this building, all right? You know, sadly, I think a lot of us could lay our Bible up on a shelf out there in the foyer and just come back and get it next week because we don't touch them during the week. How are we going to bleed Jesus if we don't learn more about him? That's going back to the rabbi story. What'd they say? You're so much like your rabbi, you've got his dust on you. We don't want dust on our Bible. We want Jesus' likeness on us. We want Jesus' likeness on us. Get to know the Lord. Get to know the Lord. Man, that's good. Net number four. We just got two more. To follow him, we have to leave it all. And here's the, here's the challenge. Boy, I don't want to leave nothing. I like all that I've got, Brother Todd. I've got so much. I've got, a, I've got a storage building, and I've got a storage building for my storage building. I've got it, I've got it all. What do you say here, guys? Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, I wonder why Jesus picked those two words. What do those two words represent? They represent their career, and they represented the most important relationship in their life. Here's what you got to be willing to do. And I know this is, this is like, what is wrong with you? But even Jesus did it. We talked about it last week. You remember the day that, that Mary came with some of his stepbrothers? And they said, we need to talk to Jesus. And they went in there and said, Jesus, your mom's outside. He said, who is my mom? Who is my brothers? He said, the one that obeys me. He's saying, look, there's nothing more important than my obedience to Christ. Nothing more important. Nothing more important. Nothing more important. Your career's not more important than God. Your family's not more important than God. One of these young people, one of these days, God, God might ask you, I want you to go and I want you to be a missionary over in Ethiopia. And man, it's bad over there right now. And you might go to mom and dad and they might say, you're not going anywhere. Right, Annette? Ah, Nicole used to tell her she wanted to be a missionary. Now, I don't know. Why don't you rethink that, Annette? Why don't you rethink that? I know what you mean. My daughter came to me in camp a few years ago. I'd like to be a missionary. But you know what? You're going to have to realize, you're going to have to decide who has the greatest sway over your life? Is it Jesus? Is it your mom? Is it your dad? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? And here's what I believe, guys, with all my heart. When we put Jesus number one, he'll make room for all those other things and they'll just fit perfectly in your life. 
He's not asking you to walk away, but sometimes you do. They told a story about a young girl that was saved on a mission trip. Their church went on a mission trip, and they baptized her, they baptized her right there on the foreign soil. She went home, and her parents found out about it. And they said, you're going to have to denounce Christ. You're not going to be a, you're not going to be a Christian in this house. She said, I can't. I've already given my life to Jesus. I can't. And so she began to hear them talk. They locked her in her bedroom. No food, no water. They locked her in there. And she began to hear it. said, we're going to have to kill her. said, so she's not going to denounce Christ. She can't stay in this house. We're going to have to kill her. And I mean, they were, they were literally going to kill their own child. You know what's weird? Their false God had more sway over their life than our real God has over our life sometimes. Think about that. They were going to kill their own daughter because they thought she believed the wrong way. Is that right? No. But I'm saying they still had more sway. They were more brain, more brain situated toward their God than sometimes we are ours. She overheard that they had to run up to the hospital. One of her sisters went in premature labor, and she knew she had to escape. She escaped. Eight months later, she found her way back to Summit Church in North Carolina. Brother Greer said he just met her this week in this, the sermon he was preaching. He said she had to decide whether, who had the greatest sway in her life. Was it Jesus or was it her parents? Because they asked her to, to renounce Jesus. They asked her to deny Jesus. She said, I can't do it. I can't do it. He said, they said immediately, they were so drawn by this teacher, by this great rabbi, by this Savior, they left their career and they left the greatest relationship they had in their life because they knew Jesus was greater than any of those. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Guys, I don't think in America we have ever really sacrificed for Jesus. That bothers me because when I look around the globe now, every night on the TV, guys are murdering Christians. They are killing Christians by the thousands, by the hundreds and thousands. And we sit here, and we sit here and relax, and we sit here, and we go tell someone if we want to. We go to church if we want to. We, if there's anything else going on, we'll do that first. I, I know how we are. I know how we are. Guys, have we ever sacrificed anything for Jesus? If there's nothing else on our calendar, we'll do something for Jesus. What has greater sway over your life? What has greater sway over your life? If you're a Christian, be a Christian. But don't just be a Christian in title. Be a disciple. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. Last one. He commands us to spiritually reproduce. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. He wants us to reproduce. What's at the core of First Baptist Church Kaiser? Reproducing Christians. Christians reproducing Christians. That's our core. Everything else is great. Everything else is wonderful. We love doing the big tree every year. I love it. Many people come. But what's at the core of that tree? That people come to know Christ. What's at the core of Bible school? That little kids come to know Jesus as Savior. What's at the core of these Sunday school classes? That you know more about him so you can go tell people more about him. Why do we come together and worship? So we can know more about Christ. And we can see people come to know Jesus as Savior. Everything we do, ask this question. Uh, anything you want to do in this church, any, any party or anything you want to do, what's at the core of that? And the answer should always be this, so that we can either grow together more for Christ or we can bring people to know Christ as Savior. If we'll, if we'll use that method every time we want to do something in this church, we'll pick right every time. And you notice it's not because I like doing that, or because we've always done that, or because that's what we think is the greatest thing. We want to do it because it will going to lead people to Christ. It reproduces Christians. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. I want you to Think about the great commandment. When Jesus first started his missionary, his mission, 
ministry here on earth. He said, they asked him a question. They said, where are you going? And Jesus said, come and see. That's when he first started. He said, where are you going? He said, come and see. About halfway through the ministry, Jesus asked another que- answered another question. He said, they said, what are you doing? He said, I want you to come and die. You remember that? It says that many followed him. And when he said, you've got you to be willing to die. You've got to be able to sacrifice yourself. You've got to be able to do what I do. And it says in there, one of the saddest verses in the Bible, and many followed him no more. And then right before he sent it back in heaven, what did he say? Go and tell. So he went from come and see to come and die to go and tell. Come and see sacrifice. When you come and see, you're going to come and ask Jesus into your life. Now, some people just stay at that thing. Sometimes they never accept Christ. They're just coming to look. They just want to look around. No thanks, just shopping. You ever had somebody come up to you? You know, you pull in a car lot. Hey, what's your, I'm just looking. I just come and see. I just want to come and see. Some people in this room are still looking over in there. I just want to come and see what's going on. They never stepped on over and said, I want to come and believe. Some of us come and believe, but we never, we're still in that come and see stage. A lot of us. Right, we haven't moved over to that come and die stage yet because that's sacrifice. I don't want to give up nothing. I like all that I've got. And now when we move beyond that, when we realize that we, he has lordship over everything I have, and then we get in this third stage, we're ready to go and tell. We're ready to go and tell. Where are you at? Where are you at? Are you in the come and see stage? Are you in the come and die stage? Are you in the go and tell stage? Who's your one is about the go and tell stage? He's asking us to go and tell. Listen to this statement right here, this verse. Therefore, go back one, Russell, I'm sorry. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. What's he saying there? Go. Go back one second, sorry. It says go, baptize, teach, now, what's, what's all them together do? They make disciples. I want you to go. I want you to baptize. I want you to teach. I want you to make disciples. Now, here's the next statement. We'll close with this. When will Jesus learn, when will church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. Nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christians, workers, do this job. Individual women and men are God's method. God's plan for discipleship is not something, but someone. It's something, not something, but someone. In the Baptist church for years, in churches for years across America, we've tried this little program, that little program, and I guess you could say this, who's your one, is a program. But at the heart of this program is someone. There's two someones, really. There's one telling the story, and there's one hearing the story. It's not about something, it's about someone. It will always be that. Jesus didn't come to this earth for something. He came to this earth for someone. That's you. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Woo. Everybody take a deep breath. Take all that in, all right? Man. Let's bow together. Hey, Father. Hey. Thanks for joining us today. We pray that God spoke to you through the message. If you'd like to keep up with what's going on at FBC Kaiser, you can find us online at fbckaiser.com or download our app. We hope to see you soon and may God bless you.